Hey guys, Kent Brindley here, Vintage Animation Nerd, bringing you the top 10 Filmation cartoons in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Filmation. The very company that probably made me a Vintage Animation Nerd. Just a second. little backstory here between Filmation and Hanna-Barbera and at the time Ruby Spears or Deke Enterprises or Sunbow they all came together to make me the vintage animation nerd that I am today to the point where I have to rewatch these series on disc I saw I used to hear the Filmation presents chimes or see the or see the rainbow lettering and know that something epic was getting ready to happen. Now, my personal top 10 Filmation cartoon, Filmation animated series. We're talking the animated series. I did not really watch the live action stuff except for Shazam. Um, we're going to start off with some dishonorable mentions that will never make this list under any circumstances. We're talking Sabrina, the Groovy Ghoulies, Hero High, um, what was it? Frady Cat will never make my favorite anime, never make my favorite animated series list. I found them all to be way too goofy. I probably... I didn't see them until I was an adult, and by then they were on DVD, so there were two problems. First, I'm watching these as an adult, and secondly, when Entertainment Rights released the Filmation Library on DVD in the mid to late 2000s, they used the PAL sped-up versions of the episodes... So they sounded even goofier than they probably did when they were first broadcast. That on top of the facts that I did not have an established childhood memory of watching these. The honorable mentions that just miss my top ten favorite animated series list. Honorable mentions. Okay. We're talking about the likes of Zorro, we're talking the Lone Ranger, I used to rent the big box VHS's of them that Family Home Entertainment put out a lot. I used to rent them all the time. They were good enough series, I just never got into either of their canons. Um... The animated version of Shazam, same story. Uh, there were about three or four episodes on that cassette that I rented, and I rented that VHS a lot. Um, I enjoyed it enough, but again, it just... In fact, I enjoyed a lot more than the Shazam movies. But... It just misses the top 10 favorite animated series list from Filmation. Uh, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. Same story. Space Sentinels, Young Sentinels. It should make the list. It just misses it. And whether you call them the Space Sentinels or the Young Sentinels, I don't know. It's... Neither here nor there. All good enough series. Just not quite there yet. Alright. Let's get into the list. At number 10, we've got the Archies. But which version of the Archies? Any of them. Just because Filmation tried to recycle and reuse the Archies in multiple seasons and multiple series titles throughout the 70s, in the same way that Hanna-Barbera tried to 
keep reusing the meddling kids trope in different series by another name didn't make them good for me uh, I, I first saw the Archies again not only as an adult but on DVD so that with the sound sped up and messed up they probably sounded even goofier than they did when they were originally broadcast it's um just wasn't my personal cup of tea so why are they on the list well without the archies there would also not be a sabrina and probably not a groovy ghoulies hence also why they are number 10 on the list I can still appreciate what Filmation thought they were trying to do with the Archies. Just isn't all, it just isn't always for me. Number nine, Filmation Ghostbusters, the animated one, the Filmation version of Ghostbusters. Let's go Ghostbusters. That's the one. I'm giving myself a lot of heat for placing this with all the way down at number nine. I I was very forgiving of this when I was little. Again, I would see the Filmation Presents logo. I would think that gold was getting ready to come on screen. And um, I have many fond memories of sitting in front of the TV set watching Filmation Ghostbusters followed by Brave Star. I think they were, were broadcast on WGN, but that part is but that particular part is waning with age. I could be just pulling that out of thin air. I just know that Ghostbusters preceded Brave Star every afternoon Monday through Friday. I always preferred the Filmation version of Ghostbusters over the real Ghostbusters based on the films. I still stand behind that today. Primeval and his ghostly minions made Filmation's Ghostbusters what they are. Well, you can't have hero a hero without villains, let's be realistic. Yes, the villains always make the hero who they are. Still love the characters of Primeval or Scared Stiff or or Fangster, for instance. So what happened? Why is Filmation's Ghostbusters at number nine? Belfry and the Ghost Command gimmicks. Almost every single piece of furniture in Ghost Command absolutely had to have a voice. And in the case of Ants of Bone and once or twice the Skelevator, they had a personality too. Hey, even the real Ghostbusters understood that one that one annoying character in Slimer was enough. And don't get me started on on Bratterat, who was honestly no better than Belfry was. Yeah. And Eddie Spencer as a human being could be almost as annoying as as the anthropomorphic characters inside of the office. So, Filmation Ghostbusters lands itself at number nine. At number eight, we have <laughs> we have He-Man from from Sagar. No, John Blackstar, astronaut. Blackstar at number eight. 
Black Star ran for 13 episodes on CBS, Saturday mornings. It was 1980, and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe was still a fledgling of an idea. Masters of the Universe wasn't even a toy line until... Shoot, it was long before I was born. It was the first wave of characters, 81. Yeah, I think the first wave of... Masters of the Universe characters had 81 printed on them. I wouldn't be born for another three years. I, I can't tell you. And Black Star was on TV in, in 1980. To be fair, Gloob came along in about 86, six years after Black Star went off the air and thought they were going to peddle action figures of his character. Because at the time, they couldn't do that yet. They could not have a toy line and an um, animated series runs subsequently, but more on this later. Anyway, John Blackstar was an astronaut from Earth. He landed on the planet Sagar and had a mighty sword. Well, one half of a mighty sword. Um, Alan Oppenheimer's villainous character had the other half of said mighty sword. Except he called himself Overlord at the time, not Skeletor. And, um, Blackstar was aided and abetted by a beautiful sorceress voiced by the late great Linda Gary. Uh huh. Uh huh. And a bunch of, and a pack of seven dwarfish, twiggit or widget lookalikes, and no, the twiggits and the widgets were never my favorite characters, but in this case they were called trobits, they lived within the Sagar tree on the planet Sagar. Um, yeah, Black Star was honestly a good show, it um, it helped pave the way for a great thing. More on that later. Number seven. The New Adventures of Superman. The very first DC Comics hero that Filmation put on screen Saturday mornings. And I am going to take some heat for this. I am going to take some heat for putting... Filmation's version of Superman all the way at number seven. If they hadn't animated Superman, Filmation most likely would never have animated Aquaman or The Flash or Hawkman or the Teen Titans or the Justice League or the Green Lantern. And they definitely would not have animated Superboy without the without Superman. It's just, I'm sorry, Superman was never my favorite hero. He was never my favorite comic hero at all. He, um, I rented uh, one of those Warner Brothers film releases from the, of the Superpowers collection, which had about six Superman shorts on it, a lot when I was little, and I liked most of those shorts. There's maybe a handful of episodes of Filmation Superman that I enjoyed. That it is still Superman. But, and here's the huge but, again I say, if Filmation hadn't animated Superman, they most likely would not have touched number six, Batman and Robin. The Adventures of Batman and Robin. Boy, wonder. Who could forget Lou Scheimer's voicing of Batmite? But we're not talking about that Batman series at all. No. We are not talking about the new Adventures of Batman. We're talking about the Adventures of Batman with Robin Boy Wonder. The one from 68. The one that 
the one that joined the Superman Batman Hour of Adventure. The one that joined the likes of Superman, Aquaman, Hawkman, Green Lantern, Flash, Justice League, Teen Titans, Super White, Batman and Robin. The one that directly followed the 1966 live action series and still allowed the caped crusaders to throw punches. Seeing as the speech bubbles when they connected, but. Alright. Once again, I rented this video from the Warner Brothers Home Video Superpowers Collection all of the time. I loved these episodes when I was little. Um, it's still Batman, who is by far and away my favorite DC Comics hero. And he... And I still remember being excited at the end of the VHS where I, where I thought that I could possibly read a Filmation production. Okay, I was about five and, and, had, and had started to read maybe three years earlier. I could still recognize the word Filmation. Trust me. Even without the bright, vibrant colors. And even with the, the smiley face logo that Filmation was using at the end of the 60s. Yeah. The Adventures of Batman and with Robin Boy Wonder had um, some very entertaining episodes, some very colorful villains. Casey Kasem and Olan Soleil as Robin and Batman, respectively were great voice actors for them. I enjoyed their vo voice characterizations for the Caped C Crusaders long through the 70s run of Super Friends when they continued to voice their characters. Number five. Flash Gordon, the original. The original season, the first season. The serial style season from 1979. Flash Gordon 79. The first season, great. It ran seamlessly. It was in the serial style. Um, the first 16 episodes ran seamlessly together. Uh, Ming the Merciless was a tyrannical overlord voiced in a very early role by Alan Oppenheimer. Um, Flash was definitely a daring hero who had to overcome a lot of great odds to, to win. The animation on the early Flash Gordon, on the first season of Flash Gordon, was beautiful. The voice acting was great. The storytelling was almost flawless. And it was quite a bit darker and more violent than I think a lot of animated series dared to be at the time because it was supposed to be a serial. Along came season two. Dr. Hans Zarkov was replaced by a, a tiny pink mascot dragon called Gremlin. And all of a sudden, the target demographic for Flash Gordon was, was taken down by about five years. Gone were the were 16 episodes that flowed seamlessly and flawlessly together to be replaced by I think season 2 had 8 um, either 8 or 12 I can't remember episodes 
that were actually two shorts a piece that had nothing to do with one another, let alone with what the next sequence of episodes was. What happened? Where did Dr. Zarkov go? Where did Gremlin come from? And who asked for this? I think I answered my own question. It was little brothers and sisters who asked for Gremlin. Yeah, that was number five. Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon season one cements itself in a very worthy contention for the top ten favorite filmation cartoons. Number four, Brave Star. Marshall Brave Star came to the planet of New Texas to, to help combat the evil of Stampede. His, um, his closest associate, Tex Hex, and the four carry-on bunch who were Texas outlaws and I don't believe they were ever called that while on screen. A power source called uh, well a power source and currency called carrium has been discovered on New Texas. New Texas needs about a thousand lawmen to protect its denizens from those who would come to steal Carrium and, and misuse it, they got one lawman. One lawman with the ant with the spiritual powers of strength of the bear, speed of the puma, eyes of the hawk, and ears of the wolf. One lawman was enough. Enter Marshall Bravestar. His spiritual guidance, shaman, his, his tough as nails, bold and dependable sidekick, 3030, 3030's canon Sarah Jane, um, the goofball deputy fuzz of the, the goofball prairie person deputy fuzz, and, um, and the gorgeous Judge J.B. McBride, occasionally aided and abetted by Handlebar, the bartender. They are the force of good on New Texas right now. Against Tex Hex and his evil. Brave Star was quite a bit darker than He Man or She Ra were. The, um, the colors on New Texas weren't nearly as vibrant. Filmation made it work. Less vibrant colors added to slightly darker tones for the series. And it, and it definitely wasn't nearly as goofy as Filmation's Ghostbusters. Brave Star would also become, sadly, Filmation's final syndicated animated series. But they went out with an appropriate bang. And, and yes, as with most Filmation cartoons, especially from the 80s, Brave Star was heavy handed on the moral preaching and prattling but he wasn't afraid to tackle the serious issues there were two episodes in particular that I can think of right off the top of my head that were not afraid to tackle the serious issues and Taylor may make, make those lessons for a younger audience Thank you, Filmation. Thank you, Marshall. Number three. Hey, 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 hey. 
It's Fat Albert. I am stepping away from from action and adventure. I am walking back to music and comedy. And for a trailblazing and groundbreaking animated series. If any episode of Filmation's Fat Albert was worthy of making this number three, I am talking about their seasons from the 70s. The first three seasons, the ones with the musical numbers at the end of each episode. I am, I am not talking about the Brown Hornet or e somehow even worse, the Legal Eagle. Dad Albert and the Cosby Kids tackled the issues of lying. They tackled the issues of inclusion. They tackled mm, minor drinking. They tackled smoking. They tackled um, pranks. They tackled acceptance of a tomboy. They tackled playing hooky. Tackle getting your tonsils out. They tackle bullies, stage fright, um, the importance of education. So many more that I could probably mention. And they did it. They did it with a smile. And again, this was the early 70s, and it was, and Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids were, were one of the very first prominently predominant African-American urban TV shows in animation. Well... I don't think it was I don't think it was made for me. I could still appreciate it. It could it could still reach across the race barrier and be appreciated by just anyone. Now that Albert and the Cosby kids got you set up for music and fun and if you were not careful you'd learn a little something before they were done. Where is the controversy behind Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids today? Who was their co-creator? The person who was at least in part responsible for putting them on screen. Fat Albert's voiceover and the live action interfiller between scenes to, to interrupt the action for commentary. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you a young Bill Cosby. Um, we know a little something about Bill Cosby now that we didn't really need to know that. And they're allegations, they're just allegations. They are allegations, but they're serious ones. I am willing to separate the art from the artist. Fat Albert still belongs in the upper echelon of filmation cartoons. The life lessons learned from, from Fat Albert haven't changed. Okay. Uh, that's out of the way. Number two. I have to separate these two somewhere. Um, if I were just talking about my top ten favorite animated series of all time, I would still conflate these two together in an infinite tie. I need to draw the line somewhere. 
And I'm putting She-Ra at number two for my favorite filmation series. Is. Um, the Great Rebellion of Etheria dealt with a pretty great threat in the evil horde. An evil horde who was not afraid to call themselves evil and who actually ruled many portions of Etheria. With only the Great Rebellion to keep them from, from gaining a complete foothold. And this was a neat, and this was a horde that ruled that completely ruled other planets. Well, well, along comes Shira and the Great Rebellion to to stop Hordak and the evil horde from a complete to keep Hordak and the evil horde from a complete and total dominance over the planet. Well, again, I was not Shira's target demographic. I will, I will say that right out loud. And yeah, part of what made Shira so great for me was the, was the sight of Dora, Glimmer, Asta. Yeah, hey, age two, I knew I was looking at something pretty. All right, anyway. Plus her... Plus, I digress about the threat of the evil horde and the power of her sword of protection. The power of the sword of protection to change into any weapon she needed just added so much greatness to this. Number one. Number one. I have kept you in suspense for this long. If Shira was number two, who didn't see this coming? Yes. Number one. E Man. And the Masters of the Universe. The very first toy line I started collecting, the very first animated series I remember watching on a daily basis. And one that I discovered when I first learned how to use the TV remote for myself, and boom, there was animation on in the afternoon. E-Man and the Masters of the Universe was very, very groundbreaking between Filmation and Mattel. They managed to break the barrier preventing an animated series and a toy line from existing seamlessly. It would lead to the six. It would lead to success for GI Joe, Thundercats, Silverhawks, Mask. Who knows what else? Shira, yes. And it, and it prompted Galoob to actually make make figures for Blackstar six years after John Blackstar had gone off the air. But <sighs> E-Man was just the pinnacle of everything that made Filmation so great for me. Action, adventure, comedy, um, a sense of an aura of mysticism and sorcery and science fiction. Great power and great responsibility. And 
was just great for me to, to see this. I can only imagine how great He-Man could have been if Skeletor and his evil warriors had remained the evil masters of Eternia the way that they were originally intended to be. And again, as usual, the testament to the greatness of this series is, for the most part, in its first season. That must never be forgotten. Well, I'm Kent Brindley. These were my favorite animated series done by Filmation. My absolute favorite animated company in the in my childhood. Well, that and Anna Barbera. We're not talking about them today. I'll see you soon. Kent Brindley, thanks for listening. Peace.